Introducing our head table, I'd like to uh, remind members of upcoming speakers. On Thursday, tomorrow, uh, Carol Browner, Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, will talk about the uh, Clinton Administration's environmental record on the 25th anniversary of Earth Day. Then uh, next week, or no, on Friday, excuse me, Friday, April 21st, Fernando Henrique Cardoza, the President of Brazil, will be here to tell us about what's going on in his country. And on Tuesday, April 25th, former presidential candidate Ross Perot will address our audience. Uh, transcripts uh, and audio and vi videotapes of press club luncheons and breakfasts are available by calling 1-800-500-9911, as they do on those late night television shows. 1-800-500-9911. Uh, if you have any questions for our speaker, please write them uh, on the cards at your table, pass them up to me, and I will ask as many as time permits, and we, we really encourage you to ask questions. I'd now uh, like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, Gregory Nielsen of the Canadian Broadcasting Company, Robert Park of the American Physical Society, Dr. Anthony D'Souza, editor of the National Geographic Research and Exploration. Doug Hall, assistant secretary for oceans and atmosphere at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, skipping over our speaker, Mark Johnson, media general news service and chairman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Diana Josephson, deputy undersecretary for oceans and atmosphere National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Susan Spaulding of the Daily Oklahoman, and member of the Press Club Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon, thank you. Uh, and uh, 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 Wes Pippert, oh yes, of the Missouri School of Journalism, sorry. <laughs> Our guest speaker today is Jean-Michel Cousteau. He is the son of the renowned ocean explorer and environmentalist Jacques Cousteau. And like his father, Mr. Cousteau, has spent his life exploring the world's oceans aboard the research vessels Calypso and Alcyon, and communicating to people of all nations and generations his love and concern for the planet. A graduate of the Paris School of Architecture, Mr. Cousteau is a member of the French counterpart of the American Institute of Architects. Prominent among the projects on which uh, he has collaborated are artificial floating islands, schools, a residential and recreational complex in Madagascar, and the uh, headquarters of an advanced marine study center in Marseille. Uh, he was instrumental in planning the development of a tropical island in the Bismarck Sea. And in 1969, Mr. Cousteau headed the team that transformed a 1,000 square foot section of the former ocean liner, Queen Mary, into the Living Sea Museum in Long Beach, California. He has also di directed the design and development of the Parc Oceanique Cousteau in Paris, a public attraction that introduced new ways of teaching visitors about the ocean realm without captive animals. Today, he continues his commitment to architectural innovation and exhibitry through the Living Design Corporation. Uh, Mr. Cousteau is, a, is an eloquent spokesman for the environment, quite appropriate at this time. Uh, his educational field study program, Pro Project Ocean Search, now in its 22nd year, offers people of all ages the opportunity to explore pristine marine environments and to study underwater ecosystems. Mr. Cousteau, as all of you know, has produced numerous films including the Peabody Award-winning series Cousteau's Amazon and the Emmy Award-winning Cousteau, Mississippi. He was the founder of the Cousteau Society and its sister company in France. In 1992, he created Jean-Michel Cousteau Productions to expand the range and depth of educational film program through exploration, adventure, cartoons, 
for children and environmentally oriented children's programs. Ladies and gentlemen, with the approach of Earth Day, it's our pleasure to receive Jean-Michel Cousteau. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a honor for me to be present in this institution. And uh, I remember f six or seven years ago when I had the privilege of accompanying my father um, to this very same uh, press club, I would like to uh, thank for the confidence that uh, has been bestowed in me. My presentation this morning is very unconventional as far as I'm concerned because I feel that uh, on this uh, eve of the 25th anniversary of Earth Day, uh, I had an opportunity here to really share the concerns that I do have as a human being and toward my fellow uh, humans on this planet. Uh, I have dedicated my life to a better understanding of the environment in which we live, and it is my commitment to continue with a focus on young people, particularly in the industrial world, which I believe have been somewhat uh, not abandoned, but discarded to some extent as to uh, focusing and particularly at essential prime, prime time of growth, uh, they do not have the guidance that they deserve to become the leaders of tomorrow and the best citizens. <clears throat> the subject of my presentation today is the search for sustainability. It is an idea at least as old as the early Greek philosopher Heraclitus. All life is change. Science has accepted this fact of existence. Volcanic islands arise from the depth and sink. Continents drift. Ice sheets cover continents, lowering sea level. Weather patterns and ocean currents shift. Species evolve and ecological communities adapt and develop. The balance of nature as a stable state does not exist. In a sense, Earth Day should be a celebration of, of change. It should be a day to reflect on the many coincidences that resulted in life on Earth and to think about how we might create communities that are sustainable within the regime of change. I've been asked to speak about the oceans. But every time I begin thinking of the sea, I'm drawn back to land. Odd behavior, perhaps, for a Cousteau. And yet, logical. For today, the oceans, encompassing 70% of the Earth's surface area, are more and more influenced by the activities of human beings on the remaining 30% of Earth's surface, the land. Simply put, the, face of the, ocean, the fate of the oceans is in our hands. We can decide not to continue killing them with industrial poisons, and they might survive. Or we may continue our present behavior, and the oceans will eventually cease to be a source of biological productivity useful to humans. Change is also on the lips of politicians these days. Your own city, Washington, D.C., buzzes with change. New faces, new policies, new responsibilities. Chance has even been enshrined in a document that many see as a blueprint for a better nation, the contract with America. Change can be healthy for us if it moves us toward a more democratic society and a more sustainable way of life. So let us look at this document from an ecological standpoint and see what some of the current proposals and slogans could mean 
how, with a different perspective, they might actually address some of America's real needs. As one of its tenets of change, the new leadership has pledged to seriously adapt the balance, the budget. Good. No nation can prosper if it is continually in debt. Nor can an ecosystem remain productive if more resources are taken than can be replaced. A large part of our economy is based on the exploitation of living resources. A balanced budget understands and respects nature's rhythms. An unbalanced budget exhausts resources, causing bankruptcy and unemployment. Losing natural capital means losing interest, yield, and profits as well. A good example is the northeastern ground fish industry, the ground fish industry in the northeast. Over 1,000 trawlers operate here, and the results are obvious. Despite intensified fishing activity, landings have shrunk to the 1950s level. According to NOAA, after 30 years of virtually unregulated exploitation, haddock and cod have been fished to the point of commercial extinction. Scientists estimate it will take 10 years of absolute no fishing for these species to recover. Now, the governor of Massachusetts has appealed to the president for, natu for natural disaster relief. What is natural or unexpected about this man-made catastrophe? Nothing. It was pre-programmed by people who ignored the natural budget. In balancing our budget, let us understand the environmental ramifications of what we are doing. There are many practical, proven methods for cutting the budget and lowering our operating costs. Let us start by adopting a new measure for economic success. It is by now clear that gross national product is, in, is inadequate as a measure of well-being. When I was in Valdez, Alaska, to make a film about the Exxon Valdez oil spill, I was shocked to learn that although an entire ecosystem had been damaged and a formidable fishing industry crippled, the event had actually boosted the GNP because it had created so many cleanup jobs. Obviously, such a measurement does not really reward sustainable solution to human needs. It actually encourages us to trash the planet, leaving our children with a bill which they will be hard pressed to pay. So we need to attack values and incentive to those goods and services that will ease our own impact and assist future generations. That is a balanced budget not only for this Congress's term in office, but for the duration of humanity's term on Earth. The American Dream Restoration Act claims that to assist the family. It's about time we took a good look at what is happening on this area of life. The family structure is indeed unparalleled. Wages have not kept pace with the cost of living, and working people have 15% less recreation time than they did 20 years ago. Prosperity in the minds of some depends on pillaging our natural capital. One congressman claims that he will not spare a species if it means the loss of a single job. He misses the point. The American dream was built on the exploitation of natural resources. That's what made America rich. But the days of the gold rush are over. Biodiversity, a bedrock of natural renewable resources and economic wealth, is now threatened by irresponsible resource, resource extraction. What we need is a plan for sustainable management of what's left of our renewable resources. If the new laws degrade the natural capital on which America built its prosperity, it will not only cost the congressman his own single job, it will destroy the American dream for future generations and families. But family is more than an economic unit. 
It is the original classroom, the space in which we first form our identity. Family structure becomes community structure, the motor of society. And conversely, destroy the community and you destroy the sense of responsibility that family provides. We are all familiar with the following scenario. The environmental and social costs of doing business à la Exxon Valdez are largely passed on to the local communities. The GNP rises, but the apparent well-being of some people is accompanied by unemployment, alcoholism, broken homes for many others. The service industry moves in, creating a few new jobs, while the big profits flow out to corporate headquarters somewhere else. To induce other businesses to move in, the community lowers its taxes and environmental standards ever further. This creates a new round of social and environmental costs for the local people and their descendants. Whether I have traveled in recent years, Thailand, Mexico, the US, the same process is underway. The global cash economy is trashing communities and turning self-sustaining rural people into urban refugees who sell their labor for a meager daily wage. Well, maybe not everywhere. Last year, I traveled to Ithaca, New York, to deliver the commencement address to the graduation class of Ithaca College. Ithaca is a small city like thousands of others, but with one big difference. Ithaca prints its own money. Each coupon is worth a certain amount of work. The money is accepted by all the small businesses and banks in town. And do you know what? Ithaca's small locally owned downtown businesses are thriving. I've also spent a lot of time in Fiji. Here the Fijians people never lost their land. Local culture thrives. By owning the land and engaging in a border economy, villagers are able to uphold sustainable tradition patterns of resource use. In general, the coral reefs are not overfished. And when they, are, they own their local land, the forests are not overharvested. The cash economy is making inroads in Fiji, as it is everywhere else. But the Fijians are struggling to resist external pressures. They are trying to participate selectively and maintain their independence and cohesive village lifestyle. Ithaca and Fiji are not utopias, but they are both found on a way to maintain community and sustainably manage their natural and human resources in an era in which the rock of local identity is being broken down to make rubble for the foundation of the global economy. Thinking of family values, it is important to remember that the family is the birthplace of opportunity, where the tools of self-reliance are imparted. A big part of the American dream, as I have always understood it, is being able to pass on that opportunity to the next generation. In large part, this means having an environment that works and will continue to work for generations to come. As the American President Franklin Delano Roosevelt said in 1939, if we hand down to our children a deteriorated nation, their legacy will be not a legacy of poverty amidst plenty, but poverty amidst poverty. The contract with America has a lot to say about common sense. Many people believe that government has forgotten how to solve problems using common sense. For a Frenchman, the term always seems a little vague. Something everyone agree upon with a confident nod of the head, but something that nobody can really define. Perhaps a better term would be common sense. A recognition that decisions are made with future generations and the global commons in mind. And an awareness 
that there are ecological limitations to our range of options. Common sense would indicate that it is more beneficial to use nat nature conservatively. We have all seen the effect of too little common sense. Let's look at wetlands, for example, one of NOAA's major concerns. Many people argue that destroying wetlands make good sense. And we have followed their advice. We've cleared, dredged, filled, and dumped to our heart's content. Some of us have become very rich, but the future and the commons have been disregarded. The US has lost half of its wetlands in the last 200 years. That's 60 acres per hour since the 1780s. Current losses to urbaniz urbanizations, dams, and pollution amount to 40,000 acres each year. Now, it so happens that wetlands are very important to fishermen. 75% of all commercially valuable fish depend on wetlands in some way, mostly as spawning and nursery habitat. In the southeast, southeast, it's 98%. In fact, according to NOAA, estuaries produce more food acre than best Midwestern farmland. But the good sense people have to better a better idea, coastal development. Already half of all Americans live in coastal counties, and that figure is expected to rise to 70% by 2010. What will their lives be like in 15 years? They will have to pay more for seafood because there will be less of it and most will have to be imported. They will have to pay more for pollution control and sewage treatment because the marshes that cleanse in dirty water will be gone. They will pay for seawalls because the estuaries that serve as the storm buffers will be gone and they will feel the need to pay for travel because their own coastal zone will have lost its health, its beauty, its peace. Common sense means responsibility, stewardship and controlled use, not uncontrolled exploitation. If we can't trust the users to act responsibly, then it is the job of government to step in and help, just as parents step in to guide short-sighted self-destructive children to greater maturity. Conservative resource use and management is the ultimate common sense. The changes that have come over Washington are profound. The new congressional leaders aspire to, in their own words, restore trust between the people and their elected representatives. Surely that's a step in the right direction. But in order to show common sense in our management of natural capital so that future generations can enjoy the American dream, we must restore trust to the relationship between people and their economy. Today's economy is a jungle of hidden costs. The prices we pay for finished products don't reflect the real costs of repairing the damage caused by exploiting forests, rangelands, fisheries, and wetlands. So a normal person finds it difficult to act sustainably. The price of a two by four does not include the cost of watershed restoration. The price of a cod filet does not include disaster reliefs, relief for fishermen. The price of vegetables does not include the cost of re repairing aquifers poisoned by pesticides. The price of a kilowatt of nuclear power does not include the costs of managing wastes for 240,000 years, the half-life of plutonium. If prices reflect these true costs, we would find it cheaper to manage resources sustainably rather than constantly digging into our pockets to clean up after ourselves. This is common sense and honest accounting. Honesty builds trust. 
The former Soviet president, Mikhail Gorbachev, used the term glasnost to describe the concept of economic transparency. This is what we need to adopt if we are to succeed. Environmentally responsible pricing would restore trust in the economy because there would be no more hidden costs, particularly environmental costs. For some, perhaps, this sounds romantic. But for future generations, it may be very well the key to quality of life and survival. Remember the original meaning of economy, oikonomia, is the management of household so as to increase its use value to all members of the household over the long run. And that's in the words of Herman Daly, the former World Bank economist. I've brought along a little film to illustrate this point. It concerns the costs of restoring great expense, a natural system that provided many services for free. The island republic of Nauru in the Pacific, 13 square miles of once lush vegetation, now a desert of limestone baking in the tropical sun, the remains of a century of phosphate mining. In order to fertilize the fields of the world's agricultural giants, Nauru's high-grade phosphate was extracted mercilessly by colonial powers. Since becoming independent in 1960, Nauruans have continued mining phosphate. Their leaders genuinely wanted to exploit the resource to increase the people's well-being. But in doing so, they destroyed forest and reef ecosystems, their natural capital. Today's Nauruans, a population of 10,000, have lots of money, but few options. The phosphate deposits are exhausted and four-fifths of the island are useless. Without a forest, freshwater runoff has increased, harming local sea life. Dust settling from crushing and loading operations may have disrupted the island's once beautiful skirt of coral reefs. On other tropical islands, healthy reefs burst with color and a dense variety of plants and animals all interconnected in a complex web of life. They are essential to the sustainability of island economies, providing an abundance of fish. Nauru's reefs desolate desert of sickly sea anemones and bleached corals. A dumping ground for a people who no longer live in harmony with their environment. Even as they learn to use the modern tools of scuba, local fishermen forget the basic rules of fishing, taking more fish than a reef can sustain. And younger fish, the future of an important food source. The problem of overexploitation is dependence. I was brought up by my grandfather. We were basically living off the land. Today, the means of life and the ways of life are Basically, now, depending upon mainly on what the imported stuff. Because of the transport, ships, planes, we are running out of food. <clears throat> I think no more rice on the island. Even now, whose climate has changed, rain clouds refuse to form over the desert oven. An almost futile attempt to recreate topsoil and restore rest. Blasting the pinnacles will cost $500 million, a huge debt passed on to the future generation. Can this money repair man's destruction of what nature had provided for free? The younger generation is caught in this against time. Can they win? As the film shows, exploiting phosphate caused the destruction of an island, its source, its culture. 
Delaying payment of the real costs only means that your children will be paying costs plus the interest. The contract is opposed to what it called junk science. Good. For too long, short-sighted economy interests have been allowed to overwhelm our better scientific judgment with tragic results as in Nauru. Admittedly, much natural science is too compartmentalized to provide us with a flexible, dynamic, and adaptive strategy for resource management. We need a science that establishes and explains options, a science that informs us about what each decision will cost in environmental terms, which really means in long-range economic terms. Good science would have prevented the decision to dam the tributaries of the Aral Sea in Turkestan. Soviet economists believed that diverting water would boost and rice production. In all, 30 dams were built, denying water to 97% of all the sea's estuaries. Today, 98% of the commercially valuable fish in the Aral Sea and its tributaries have been wiped out. And the crops? Well, the Aral Sea is now a dry lake bed. All dust rises from the floor and kills a good portion of the cotton and rice plants. Without adequate runoff, inside poisons concentrate in the soils. The infant mortality rate stands at 10%. The cost of this disaster is estimated at $6.5 billion per year. A major ecosystem is destroyed while thousands of miles away in a comfortable office an economist says, oops. It is absolutely necessary to develop a more holistic focus on environmental management. We need to bring together research with communication, education, and training, not only so that we arrive at credible conclusions, but so we can assist decision making by providing comprehensive assessments of current environmental knowledge and its implications. We need in discrete interdisciplinary research that describes environmental resources and environmental systems. We need to promote sustainability, and we need this to be truly global, as it is the environment we are trying to understand and protect. NOAA and the National Marine Fisheries Service are rightly a part of the Commerce Department. Presumably, these agencies provide the raw data that informs policymakers and enlightens the public. The Marine Sanctuary Program, the Coastal Zone Enhancements Program, the National Estuarine Research Reserves, these are all investments in sustainable risk management that will assure the long-term prosperity of the nation. What we are talking about, ultimately, is security and survival. Our best defense, our weapons, may save the political structures we have erected, but they cannot really provide environmental security. A young country, like a child, wants everything. At some point, we grow up and accept the fact that we can't have it all, that we must establish responsible priorities. The great Republican President Dwight Eisenhower understood this. In 1953, he said, every gun that is fired, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not closed. The world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. So let's think about some of our priorities. The $1 billion spent creating 400 tanks could pay for prenatal care for over 1 million mothers. The $1 billion spent on two submarines could half a million low-income students to college. 
Of the $125 billion spent by world nations every year on arms, only 12%, 15 billion, would be enough to immunize all children, eliminate malnutrition, and provide safe drinking water for everyone on Earth. Our dilemma has to do with our entire way of life and the impact of our priorities have on the natural system that sustains us. Above and beyond the rhetoric of political parties, there is a supremely important contract with nature. The natural systems that make our little oasis in space habitable. Under the terms and conditions of this contract, we are permitted to survive and evolve as long as we respect a few basic rules. The human species heeded this contract for over three million years. But lately, we have come to believe that we can transgress its stipulations with impunity. We now have the power to alter the environment, but we have no capacity to alter our basic biology to survive on a planet without clean air and water. Change is a capricious master, and being out of step its laws will mean termination of the contract. Let us invest in science to gain a clearer picture of our natural assets. Let us strengthen legislation that adheres to basic ecological facts, the Endangered Species Act, Clean Air Act, and Clear Water Act, are important building blocks for a coherent common sense approach to the environment. Let us develop a truly constitutive strategy of options, hearing on the side of prudence and leaving future generations more than just money, but respect and choices. Let us ask ourselves, each of us, is the environment where we grew up better or worse today than it was then? If our children and their children respect us for our stewardship of their heritage, we will have honored our contract with nature and kept the American dream alive for generations to come. Thank you very much. Now we uh, go to the questions, several on the same thing. Uh, with the uh, an 25th anniversary of Earth Day approaching, are young people as interested in the environment than they were 25 years ago? The answer is yes, uh, absolutely. 25 years ago, environmental issues uh, were not even uh, words used in a common sense. Uh, they uh, were new worlds which were brought about just like pollution was, ecology was, environment was. Um, I think that uh, all leaders have made a formidable uh, job of conveying some of those concerns. And I would say that teachers in the school system, as poorly equipped as they may be, have done a formidable job of uh, making sensitive the young people of this country uh, to the point where uh, today it is inconceivable to not uh, deal with some of those issues uh, within the household or uh, in many instances as the political system goes underway. I heard in the last uh, several elections, a great percentage of uh, the uh, speeches were made by candidates were uh, dealing with environmental issues. So I think it's here to, to stay, it's here to uh, last. It's uh, no longer what it may have appeared in the 70s, which was kind of a fashion, and uh, I have to say, and I, w I was part of it, 
the environmental movement had no plan, had no directions. Uh, today we do. We have plans, we have directions, and I think we uh, have gone from uh, being uh, looked upon as uh, uh, people who are coming to uh, destroy the system and we're in opposition to uh, the establishment uh, to uh, having a dialogue with uh, the people in charge, the people who are making the decisions. And uh, I've seen very, very major changes. And what's very exciting when it comes to young people is that perhaps more than ever, uh, they go home after they've gone to school or they've watched certain te good television programs, unfortunately there are many bad ones out there, uh, and they tell their parents. They're teaching their parents on how to take care of uh, the household, of their environment, and uh, because we have grown in a different environment, uh, we do not have the reflexes that young people have. And uh, I see children today uh, forcing their parents to have a recycling program, asking their parents to get out of the house if they smoke, and all kinds of uh, decisions of that nature which would have been totally inconceivable 25 years ago. So yes, things have uh, progressed in the right direction and children are uh, a lot uh, in there for that purpose. And we, uh, we thank them very much. Thank you. Now, <coughs> as you're aware, in the country, there's a movement on Capitol Hill to cut funding for public broadcasting. Would that affect uh, your work using documentary and educational programs? Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the um, pu yes, public broadcasting is a visible uh, target. Um, I've had conversations yesterday with some of the uh, leaders of the public broadcasting system. I don't believe that uh, it's a real issue. In the Money involved is really a, uh, a minute piece of a drop in the bucket. And uh, if that was the way to resolve our economic problem, I don't think uh, we would hesitate a second. But it's not going to come from the cutting of public broadcasting. Furthermore, I think the public at large is supporting what the quality of programming that has been put public broadcasting. If the objective is to cut uh, the meager resources of a, uh, a, a television uh, system that has brought about quality programming uh, and encourage uh, others to produce uh, more of the bad programs which uh, prevail on our television channels today, which are so, uh, so uh, degrading to particularly to today's youth, so much so that uh, they, they are so much bombarded by programs on crimes, violence, uh, and, and ugly, that, and they, they are lacking the guidance that uh, PBS uh, offers, uh, that they are confused and don't, do not make a difference between um, fiction and reality to the point that today uh, we see uh, juvenile crime going on the rise probably because why not me? Uh, these guys have guns on the, on the screen. I can have a gun too. And I think it's not their fault. The criminals are us because we have not provided that guidance that they needed. And I think to uh, deplete the, uh, the, the meager resources of such a, a small budget that uh, this is representing is really a, a, a bad move uh, which is not popular. And in any event, if that was happening, it's not destroyed PBS. Thank you. Now. As I said, uh, EPA Administrator Browner is appearing here tomorrow to report on the Clinton administration record on the environment. How do you rate the Clinton administration environmental record? And secondly, is Vice President Al Gore, who appears to be the only person in the administration, according to the questioner, speaking out on environmental issues, is he doing enough? <laughs> uh, 
I have to say that overall I've been a little disappointed by the performance of this administration when you compare what was promised to what has been accomplished. Nonetheless, a lot has, has happened, and uh, I have to say that uh, uh, Vice President Gore has for a long time a track record of uh, uh, wanting to improve the environmental qualities of this nation, and uh, I'm sure he's doing everything he can uh, in his power to accomplish that. Uh, there's a lot more to do, and uh, uh, they, they have to perform more than they have so far to uh, convince uh, all of us that uh, uh, the administration is doing everything in their power to, uh, to improve the quality of our environment. So I would say that the performance has been not up to uh, the expectation, in my views. Some of it has taken place. A lot more can happen. Well, on that subject, we have a, a Clean Air Act, a Clean Water Act, an Anti-Noise Act. What other laws do we need now to pre preserve the endangered parts of our environment? I, I don't think we <laughs> need more laws. Uh, we have enough laws. We need to implement those laws. We need to enforce them. We need to make sure that uh, we manage our resources better if laws that I would promote today is to no longer look at the ocean as a no man's land where the majority of the surface of our planet is not under any kind of legislation. And that's the open ocean where you can do anything out there. So if anything, I would encourage strongly to create at an international body level and I'm not sure it's the United Nations because the United Nations has no decision power, but in some fashion to create the law of the sea, a real law of the sea, which is, uh, as uh, Mr. Pardo said, a common heritage. We chopped off the ocean or pieces of the ocean uh, with the, uh, the economical zone or the 200 mile zone, and even that is not properly administered. In other words, we're dealing with a very abstract subject there where uh, resources which are today in, let's call it U.S. waters, maybe in Mexican waters or Canadian waters tomorrow because fish move and, and these resources are not properly managed. So they are on the verge of extinction for many of the species. Uh, we are taking more out of the ocean than the ocean can replace. And that is, in economical terms, a complete nonsense. We are gobbling up the capital. Instead of leaving off the interest, which would be the surplus of a population, we are in the process of depleting those vital resources. And that's where I would put new legislations at the international level uh, in order it would preserve jobs to start with, but it would uh, uh, it would preserve those resources for future generations. Today, and I'm saying this from first-hand experience, I grew up on the Mediterranean coast on the French Riviera, and what I used to see when I was a child, when I was diving there with my family, when I was going out with fishermen, I can see today. I cannot take you there and show you what I used to see when I was 15 or 20 years old. It's gone. And when it comes to very personal issues now, when I want to take my own children and I want to show them what I used to see, it's not there. So the frustration that rises from that uh, gives me a lot of strength to want to stop this uh, downgrading uh, quality of life in the ocean and make sure that we protect and preserve what's left and manage it properly, not to starve people to death on the contrary, to support more people than we have so far. And uh, so laws, yes, as far as the ocean is concerned, globally, in order to no longer treat the ocean as, as a no man's land, but as a place that we depend upon, uh, no longer as a universal sewer, but a place that nourishes us and uh, needs a great deal of management and recognition and support. Is there a nation in Europe or elsewhere that you can point to 
as a model for the United States to follow in environmental matters? No. There is not a nation I'd like to point uh, as, as a model. I, uh, I've elected to live in your country uh, for the last 27 years for a very good purpose. And I will call it the nation of the extremes, uh, the, the bad and the good. And I think if anybody or any nation has showed uh, ways to uh, change things around, has the power of doing this and the resources of doing it, the United States does. Now, there are other countries who are doing a lot of efforts uh, and, and successfully, but um, I don't think there's a model out there. I think as, as a people of this planet, we need to uh, continue to understand, do more uh, concrete uh, research and better understand our environment in order to better manage it. And I think the U.S. is probably as well, if not much better equipped than any other countries in the world. Uh, there are uh, good management programs in some of the nations uh, in Western Europe or in Scandinavia and um, in Australia, for example, the, the Great Reef uh, is extremely well managed uh, in, in many ways when you consider all the pressures that are put upon that environment. So there are ideas elsewhere that could be picked up and brought in and used so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. But I would say th this country can be the model and can be the nation that uh, would be looked upon by others as many other countries are looking upon the U.S. as uh, the model for uh, a better living and better management of our resources. In the final analysis, the questioner asks, isn't the concept of sustainable development really an, uh, an oxymoron? Well, no, uh, I, I, can, I cannot agree with that. I think, see, we, we've made a big mistake uh, in the last maybe 10 or 15 years of believing that we as a species are part of an evolutionary system or process. It's not true. Uh, because of our formidable tools, which are our hands and our brain, uh, we have been able, after three million years of struggling for survival, we were not doing very well as a species for the majority of our existence on this planet. Uh, but finally, we, we put together the, the tools that we have, which no other species has, and that's the brain and these hands. And we literally came out ahead by uh, finding a way to protect ourselves. And, and the protection is expressed here, where we have clothes and we control the, the temperature in which we are, we're protecting ourselves from outside, we can go faster places and so on, to the point where we have literally removed ourselves from being an intricate part of the environment. We are no longer, and I know I may shock some of you, we are no longer a part of the environment. But the paradox comes from the fact that we depend upon it for the quality of our lives, whether it's the fundamental uh, necessities, which is the quality of air and the quality of water, if you don't have either one of those, you're gone, you don't exist. And then from the quality of our life, which are more abstract uh, values, such as enjoying the pretty flowers on, a t the, flowers on, on the table, or the butterflies, or the birds and the fish. Uh, without them, life would become a little boring, or very boring. So um, I, I think that if uh, we consider that we have removed ourselves from the natural processes of nature, uh, we cannot call ourselves part of evolution. We cannot say that as we wipe out species, whether they're plants or animals on land or in the ocean, uh, it is a natural process, a natural uh, evolution. It's not. We, are, we really have made ourselves an accident. And we should take advantage of that to make our lives better than, than it is, rather than letting everything go down. The, so um, I would say that uh, 
we uh, uh, as a, a people, we have a responsibility toward ourselves. The butterflies and the birds and the, and the flowers don't care. <laughs> we're the only ones who do. And uh, as, we, as we manage those resources well, we'll manage the quality of our lives better. Is the American obsession with lawsuits spreading to the seas with courtroom fights over recovery rights and other nautical litigation? <laughs> well, um, yes. Uh, there are too many lawsuits. Uh, I, I remember a, a great um, human being who passed away, unfortunately, a couple years ago, uh, the inventor of the flashlight and the side scan sonars, Dr. Harold Edgerton from the MIT. Uh, I had the, the privilege of growing up with him in many times of my life. Uh, and he told me shortly before he passed away, he said, you know, Jean-Michel, all my life I lived with four principles. And I'll, let me pass them on to you. And I've adopted them. He said, work as hard as you can. Tell everybody everything you know. And that's the answer to your question, the third one. Make all your deals with a handshake. <laughs> and the fourth one was have fun. And uh, I'm doing all of this. I think uh, the legal system is taking uh, an overproportion. I have lawyers. Everybody has lawyers. E even some of them are my friends. Uh, <laughs> so. But uh, look at what's happening in, in California now. I mean, this is totally absurd, the amount of resources which are wasted into this uh, gobbledygook out there. Uh, who cares? I mean, who? it's a little incident which, uh, I'll tell you, in the history of this country will disappear in, in a garbage can very quickly. So uh, yes, there are too much too much legal disputes which could be resolved very simply by, uh, see, w we started having lawyers when we stopped fighting physically, fist fighting. We sent somebody else to do it. Well, they are as uh, chicken. Are. So um, instead of doing this, I think we should go and resolve the problems ourselves. Head, head on. At least I always try to do that myself. It costs a lot of money at the end of the month. Thank you. Now, uh, before we get to the famous final question, uh, I have a couple of gifts for you. First, a certificate of appreciation for being with us today. A coffee mug, National Press Club coffee mug for those uh, <laughs> long days and nights ease. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your hospitality and the push uh, and the honor of being uh, uh, a member of your club. I understand that uh, uh, my picture is going to be on the wall for the next two years. Uh, please, uh, if you feel that I can be of help and assistance, invite me before it's off. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, otherwise, in, in any instance, uh, uh, believe me, I'm here to support, to help in every possible way that I can. Um, I'm a, a, a great friend of the institutions that have invited me here, and I want to thank NOAA for their support. And uh, they, they should know that uh, I, I will work as hard as I can um, to help them if I can, and any other people that I can assist, because I have a mission, I believe in it, and uh, I uh, like to look at kids straight in the face and know that I'm doing everything for them. Thank you very much. Uh, now I have a final question, sir, for you. And then, but, but, but after the answer, uh, please stay seated for a minute. I have a few announcements to make. The final question. Speaker Newt Gingrich will address the National Press Club in July, right? July. Would you please give me now one question to ask him when he comes? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would um, 
very simply ask him to listen to other people. I think we have a lot to share. I've uh, taken the liberty of, um, and I have the letter right here in this document, of sending in my presentation of today, uh, like I have with uh, other members of uh, government and uh, the House and the Senate. So uh, please read my presentation. That's what I would ask him to do. <laughs> now, as you know, we have some workshops out there uh, that will follow our breakfast this morning. Uh, let me call your attention to them. At 10.15, about 15 minutes from now, the uh, Coastal Zone Management uh, Workshop, Partners Partnerships for the Future, NOAA.